Jamie Dimon is the head of JP Morgan, one of the most important banks in the world, and he recently opined on the state of the US Treasury market, and he didn't think too highly of it. But JP Morgan itself may be buying US Treasuries hand over fist, the disconnect. We're going to talk about it right now with Jeff Snyder, head of global research for Alhambra Investments. Welcome back to Making Sense, Eurodollar University production. My name is Emil Kalinowski, and I'm looking for my notes. Which page are they on? There they are. Here they are. Okay, Jeff. So in episode 25, we spent 20 minutes discussing uh, American Captain John Paul Stapp, Captain Edward A. Murphy, Englishman William of Ockham. He, that was from the 14th century. And if memory serves me right, we may have mentioned Robert J. Hanlon. But if we didn't, we're going to bring him up now because Hanlon, along with a number of other thinkers and writers, including American psychologist William James from the 18th century, Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, American physicist Richard Feynman. Uh, Feynman. I think you're just, rolling, you're just throwing out names at this point. No, no. <laughs> Robert Heinlein, American. This is the, the quote I'm going to attribute to all of them. They've all said it over the last couple hundred years, including German Renaissance man, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Uh, and each one of them has said something along these lines. Well, I don't want to steal the thunder. Do you remember you opened up your article with this quote? Do you remember what it is? Yeah, I didn't know Goethe said it. I mean, we're talking about never attribute to malice what is easily explained by stupidity. And I, I think it's a, it's a common razor because, you know, in our lives, we like to believe that mistakes are due to somebody's, you know, somebody's intent. There has to be a reason for it. It can't just be blind stupidity. When in fact, I think a lot of these people, and I think our own experience proves that most often it really is because let's face it, especially uh, given the situations that we find ourselves in with the financial and monetary systems, that there is an awful lot of stupidity to go around. And so what we're trying to say is something that uh, John Kenneth Galbraith said very well in one of these books behind me, The Short History of Financial Euphoria, is that during the boom, during the glory, the people that reach the top, the people that have a lot of money, are assigned too much credit, too much intelligence, too much foresight. And afterwards, in the devastation of the bust, we realize, oh, they, you know, maybe they were very talented administrators or corporate politicians. Maybe they didn't quite have a handle on what was really happening within the system. And what we're talking about is that that might be the case when on May 7th, 2018, the head of America's most important bank told Bloomberg Television that the American economy was strong, which fans of this show know that was not the case. And then could we also say, but maybe he was just being political, Jeff. And can we also say that when he said the U.S. Treasuries are not great, that they're going to be losing value? Could we also say that maybe it was a political statement and he has to say that as the head of a bank, of an American bank? Or did he really believe that? I have no idea what Jamie Dimon really believes, but I, have to, I do know that he's, he's basically a trained economist. He is, as you point out, more of a politician than anything. And I think the way you put it just now is, is exactly right. When things are going well, you know, was he good at understanding that things are going well or why, or was he just good at going with the flow, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's a, I mean, if you look at, uh, for example, a monetary history, Milton Friedman's book, in it, he writes the same thing about the Federal Reserve and his observations. When things are going well, people say, oh, monetary policy is fantastic. It works really great. When things are not going well, people say, well, monetary policy was just up against too much of a problem. So that doesn't argue that monetary policy is useful. It's what it argues for is what we said at the top is that maybe there's just there's more going on here than simply what meets the eye. And in the case of Jamie Dimon in the U.S. Treasury market, as a you know, he used to be a member of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York Board of Directors. Was he doing Jay Powell a favor, saying, "Look, I see inflation. I see I see things going in the right directions. I think the Fed has figured this stuff out." We're talking about 2018 now. You know, we're going we're to see inflation. So that necessarily is going to lead to bond, U.S. Treasury prices falling and bond yields rising because that's what we want. 
we want treasury yields to fall or where treasury yields to, to rise and bond prices to fall because that would reflect an actual recovery. And so what Jamie Dimon was trying to say was that, look, treasuries is not the place to be because things are becoming really good. And if we, had, if anybody at the bond market had actually agreed with him, then that's exactly what would have happened. Yeah, spoiler alert, treasury prices only rose after 2018. But why are we bringing up what he said two and a half years ago, Jeff? That's not fair. Why did you bring this up? Well, first of all, because he's, you know, when we look back at J what JP Morgan was actually doing, especially in 2018 and 2019, as Jamie Dimon was saying, look, the last place you want to be is in the U.S. Treasury market. JP Morgan, the bank the guy runs, was one of the heaviest buyers in the U.S. Treasury market. And so that's where you get into, was it, is he being duplicit? I mean, yeah, maybe he's being political, doing Jay Powell a favor. But was he saying, hey, sell me your treasuries at the cheapest price because I'm buying? And that's where you get into this, you know, the stuff about Wall Street and all of the dark, to dark, dark tones and, you know, this is all a conspiracy and he's, 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 he's doing the opposite of what his bank is doing. He's talking in public and, and trying to get his bank the best op, you know, best trade. And it really comes down to maybe he doesn't understand. Maybe he's just a trained economist as he is. And he looked at the econometric models that Jay Powell does and came to the same conclusions that he did. But those conclusions have absolutely nothing to do with how the bank carries out its day-to-day -day activities. Because let's face it, what is Jamie Dimon's job? It's not to go down on the trading desk and buy and sell treasuries or Fed funds or something like that. He's not writing interest rate swap uh, contracts. He's running the bank and he's running the bank as an economist because Jamie Dimon is obviously really good at running a bank. And whether he's really good about what the bank does, that's a separate issue. And I think that's the issue we're talking about now, especially as just recently, Jamie Dimon again said, hey, I wouldn't touch U.S. Treasuries with a 10-foot pole. And so the question immediately comes to my mind is, what, what is J.P. Morgan, the bank, actually doing? Are they maybe buying Treasuries? And so we look at that. You know, it's not what Jamie Dimon says as the CEO. It's what the rest of the bank and the rest of the banking system might be doing regardless of what their CEOs might be saying. And you know what? We can turn to the Federal Reserve to get an idea of what might be happening. And it's a report that they put out. Uh, it's called the Z1 Report, officially known as the Financial Accounts of the United States. And they put out the latest Z1 on December 10th. Coincidentally, the same day that the ECB announced another 500 billion euros in stimulus. And what did we, what is that report tell us? Or what is it supposed to tell us? And then what did you look into it for? What did you see relative to this question of is JP Morgan actually buying bonds, treasuries? Well, the Z1 report, the Financial Accounts of the United States, used to be called Flow of Funds. And the reason it was called Flow of Funds, and now it's called Financial Reports of the United States, is because it was the Federal Reserve saying, let's examine every last bit of the financial system that we can possibly get our hands on. And so it's really the most comprehensive report on almost every major category of either instrument or player in the, in the securities markets or financial markets, credit markets overall. And so they keep track of really big stuff details about what's going on in the financial system as much as they know or can get their hands on. And so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty exhaustive summation of the financial system and who's doing what inside of it, even if it's not yet complete. Uh, it's not complete com uh, given the uh, global nature of the financial markets. But one of the things it does do exhaustively and comprehensively is look at what the domestic banking system is reporting. Because again, as we've, you know, our theme here this week is they have all sorts of information that only occasionally we get our, we, the public can get its hands on. In this case, through the financial accounts of the United States, we can see if, if, you know, a couple months delayed, a couple months behind what the banking system is up to. And so this, so this is episode 40 of this show of the year. And I think looking back, this is going to be the last episode of the year, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, 40 episodes. And I believe I am now going to show a chart from the Z1 report that may be the most important chart that we have shown all year. It's, it was clarifying, Jeff. I'm going to show it, but before I show it to everyone, I'm just going to tell them if they want to follow along, if you're listening to the podcast and you want to read it, it's called Inflation 
his teria number two, except there's a Z1 in there. High Z1 teria number two. Anyways, you'll find it on uh, Alhambra Investments blog post. It was posted on December 14th. Jeff, I'm going to show a, a chart now. Is this the most important chart of the year? It could be. <laughs> no, and I think, it, yeah, I think there is a lot to it because what we're looking at here is, again, the U.S. banking system, the domestic banking system, what is it that it has been doing this year? And, of course, the main message across or that most people hear is that inflation, 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 growth, money, money printing out the wazoo, right? Reckless Federal Reserve. And that's, in one part, that's, that's sort of true. At least there's, there's, there's statistics that say the Federal Reserve is expanding what it's doing. Bank reserves have skyrocketed in a, in a way that we've never seen before. And of course, we've never seen bank reserves at, to any substantial degree before 2008, which is one thing this, this chart shows, is that bank reserves are a relatively recent phenomenon. And yes, they've gone crazy in, 2000, in 2020, but what is the rest of the banking system doing? And what this chart shows, the, 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 the pink area, is that the, all, of the, all of the domestic banking system's asset, excluding the, risk, the riskless assets, including you know, what I'm talking about, U.S. Treasuries, agencies, as well as bank reserves, what are they doing? You see kind of a, the, the little bit of an increase earlier in the year, but since then, banks aren't really doing anything more. Despite the fact that supposedly they have all of this money printing at their disposal, they're actually kind of cutting back a little bit. So they're doing the opposite of what you would expect if money printing was having the money printing impact that you were, that's, that's supposed to come from it in the financial system, right? Because flush with all sorts of cash, you would expect banks to go nuts lending, at least, at least doing that, doing something, right? And what the banking system is, as far as risk assets are concerned, they're actually cutting back a little bit. To me, it's amazing, this chart. It goes all the way back to 1953, and you've got it up through 2020. But between 1953 and 2008, pretty much anything that could happen to a country did happen to the United States. You know, a few exceptions, okay. But everything that could have prob probably did. And therefore, we have a trend to go off of. We have recessions, we have booms, we have everything. And if we look at this chart, what you see is a half century or more trend. And then in 2008, you fall off the trend and you see how the Federal Reserve comes in and tries to top it off. You know, they add reserves to the system. But this chart shows completely nothing. The reserves don't compare to where we would have been had we remained on this firmly half century established trend of good and bad, and it shows us just tremendous gap in money creation, because that's what it is. You know, these banks, they create money for the global economy to run on. I don't, it, for me, it's, it was a, a simple chart that just shows the vast amount of missing money that we sort of can estimate of where we should be. Yeah, and what is that? What is the difference, right? What is, why is there the previous fifty, the previous half century, the way it is, unbroken sort of, compared to two thousand post two thousand eight? Well, you don't have the Great Depression in the beginning part of it, right? Mm -hmm. That's really the difference. What has changed over that trend, or what changed the trend? What changed reality was a monetary breakdown, every bit as serious as the Great Depression, even if it didn't lead to the short-run destruction that we saw in 1929, 1930, it did lead to the same kind of permanent shock because that's what monetary breakdowns always do. You know, the depression cycle of the, of the previous age. And so if, from 1950s forward, what we're really talking about as we, <laughs> Euro Dollar University, this is the Euro Dollar era. And so long as the euro dollar system as a whole globally was functioning, everything seemed to be fine. As you pointed out, Emil, the world experienced every bit of everything that could possibly be thrown at it, the U.S. system included. But yet, as soon as the euro dollar breaks down in 2007, all of a sudden, these met, and not just, it's not just domestic banking credit. It's all, we see it all over the place, whether it's you know, economic data from around the world, U.S. dollar data, anything. The trend always breaks in 2008 because it was a monetary system break. All right. So thanks for humoring me with that little detour because I just love this chart. 
Let's get back to the JP uh, Diamond story. JP Diamond, you know what I'm trying to say. Jamie Diamond, <laughs> JP Morgan story. US Treasuries, are they garbage? And what are banks actually doing? Uh, beginning of this year, we saw M1, M2, M3, if we have those measures. The OECD has a measure of M3. I know the Fed doesn't calculate it anymore. Anyways, we've seen sharp rises in those measures of money. And you have looked at this data, and what do you believe it was that caused those sharp rises in those measures of money? And then we'll move on to, you know, is that good or bad and, and, and so forth. Well, M1 and M2 to me are outdated measures of money, so they can be misleading. In fact, I would argue that they're almost always misleading because they don't show what's happening outside of them What's happening outside of them is vastly more important to the condition in the, this monetary system we're talking about. The monetary breakdown you saw in 2008, which, which wrecked pretty much everything, every trend line previous to that, had nothing to do with M1 or M2. It had everything to do with shadow money. As we just talked about collaterals in these uh, very intricate uh, repo spaces uh, globally. So, you know, the rise in M1 and M2, and to me, it's okay, that's fine, that's something to look at, but what is going on here, and a lot of what's going on in M1 and M2 is the increase in checkable deposits related to quantitative easing. So banks are creating checkable deposits in order to participate in quantitative eating. So what? You know, it, it's one of those things that's okay, it's, it's transferring assets and liabilities between one, one existence to another. It's an asset swap in one sense, and it's a liability swap in another because we don't know what the other side of it is in repo, especially when we talk about treasury auctions, which is what a lot of people focus on, that, you know, in, in before 2008, a lot of treasury auctions would, auctions would be settled in the repo market. It would be settled outside of these monetary aggregates, which is why you never saw bank reserves to begin with. One reason why. And so the fact that M1 or M2 are rising rapidly just simply reflects monetary policy and how the banking system is trying to uh, participate and what Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve is doing. So let's see, between the end of 2019, and this is all in your article, if anyone wants to follow along, between the end of 2019 and the end of September 2020, total assets of domestic banks increased by 2.7 trillion. 1.2 trillion of that was QE, as you said, that leaves about 1.5 trillion. Now, you're saying that the aggregate loan book gained $605 billion, of which $644 billion, let's see all of it, but you know, you can do the math. Essentially, all, almost all of it of this whole loan book was something called, what, what is that funny name category is loans else, not elsewhere classified. What were those, Jeff? That's basically anything else that's not a consumer consumer loan or a mortgage. So in this case, you know, we know it's it's commercial industrial loans, loans to businesses and things like that. And the NEC is really just the way the flow of funds or the you know the Z1 report category you know lumps together what are what would otherwise be you know a, a plethora of small categories. They basically say there's mortgages, there's consumer credit, and there's a bunch of other things. And, the, and a bunch of other things include, as I said, commercial industrial loans, which, as we know, absolutely skyrocketed in March and April as companies panicked, terrified that they were going to, that, you know, commercial paper was breaking down, repo was breaking down, they couldn't fund anything. And so they ran to their local banks and drew down these revolving lines of credit. So a huge amount of the, the increase in the loan book had, had to do with uh, companies panicking, not not because they're investing in real economic uh, programs, but because they had agreement, agreements that were in place before 2020 that they were uh, contractually able to draw against. And I would bet you that in banks, if they had known what was coming, they probably should have, but if they had known what was coming, they would have canceled these revolvers before they were ever drawn down by that much. So it's not like the banks are saying, oh, this money printing stuff is working. We're going to extend loans to businesses because they want to build stuff. They're saying it's the exact opposite, really, because the Fed is completely incompetent, because it allowed March to become a global financial crisis that panicked corporations into drawing down the revolvers. Banks had to oblige those agreements and extend the credit to these corporate customers. So the majority of that loan book growth was then the commercial industrial revolvers. What about, that leaves about, let me see, 900 billion-ish 
if we're going to keep our math straight here, was that $900 billion extended to uh, consumers, mortgages, and credit cards, or the government, or other non-financial corporations? I'm sorry, financial corporations. Where yeah. is that missing money going into? It sure wasn't consumer credit, and it sure wasn't mortgages. It's just the loan book outside of the NEC loans. Uh, those actually shrank, as we were talking about before. Risk assets have declined. And so what banks were doing was they've been loading up on U.S. Treasuries and agency debt. Basically, the, 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 the least risky, most liquid forms of assets they can get their hands on. So it was about, I think, three quarters of a trillion added mm -hmm. in, those, in those categories, which and that's an absolutely astronomical sum. So going back to our original story here, Jamie Dimon is saying he wouldn't touch Treasuries with a 10 foot Poll. And we don't know, you know, this data doesn't break it down by bank. We don't know if JP Morgan is involved, but we, it's reasonable to assume that they're going along with everybody else because as you see in the Z1 data, this, this, uh, this sudden, uh, sudden love of U.S. Treasuries isn't just this year. It goes back to the fourth quarter of 2018. Banks have been loading up on Treasuries and agency debt, the safest, most liquid assets for over two years now. And it doesn't look like it's stopping anytime soon. In the Z1 data, I believe, in just the third quarter of 2020 alone, um, the banking system added 75 billion, 78 billion, somewhere in a little bit less than 80 billion, which was amongst the highest quarterly increases on record. Now, of course, it wasn't the 220 or 200 some billion in the first, in the second quarter of, of this year when, you know, during the financial crisis, but still, even afterward, despite all this money printing, despite the purpose behind QE, which is to, to convince the banking system that, hey, everything's fine. You don't need to hold safe, liquid instruments. Go out into the real economy. Go out and lend and do risky activities. The banking system is saying, despite all this QE business, despite this talk about money printing, we want the highest quality. And we're going to segue into the, what the outgrowth of that would be, which would mean not inflation. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say is if you want the highest quality, most liquid instruments as a bank, that means you're not extending credit into the broader economy. Therefore, one which should not expect inflation. In part three, we're going to ask, we're going to discuss whether that is filtering down to the American consumer. We're going to look at the latest survey on consumer inflation expectations. <laughs>